Chapter 19 Bourbon, Barons, Tobacco Tycoons, and King Coal. The Economy of Kentucky after the Civil War, 1865 to 1995. I've mentioned to you several times how high up Kentucky was in the economics, in the social scale, in politics prior to 1860. Even though we did not have the ravages of the Civil War that states had like Mississippi and Alabama and Carolina, we still, we lost farm animals, horses, mules, we lost people, black and white, and when you lose people, you don't have people to work on your farms. But after the Civil War, even though things weren't as gloomy for us as others, there were trends that were going to develop. For instance, in agriculture, him. Now, I don't know about you, but before I took my first Kentucky history class, I had never heard the word hemp, had no idea what it was or what it was used for. But it was used in ships' riggings. It was used at bale rope. It was used for bagging for southern cotton, which was in great demand prior to the war. In 1890, even after the war, we were producing 91% of all hemp produced in the United States. But because of cheaper foreign production, especially in the Pacific Islands, and a decrease in the demand, we lost our production. Uh, during World War I, there was an increase in the demand, and because all the ports in the Pacific area were closed, so we again gained a little financial momentum ahead, and for a year or two it was fine, but then once the war was over and the ports opened up again in the Pacific, uh, we lost our market and our ability to compete. And of course, there is another use for hemp, one that you all may be more familiar with, called marijuana. Now, we're not going to go into the uses of marijuana at this point in time in this chapter, but just be aware that uh, I think we all know that there are certain areas of Kentucky uh, that are noted for their crop being, crash crop being marijuana. But if there is a void produced, and the void was produced by the losing of our hemp, something will fill it, and tobacco did replace hemp as Kentucky's main product. And tobacco is an extremely labor-intensive crop. I mean, they've got some machines to help you plant, but everything has to be done by hand, from the seed bed to the planting, to the harvesting, to the stripping, to the taking the worms off of it. It's just, and then you, you get into the warehouse and you've got to do everything by hand, to, you know, hang it up or to, to secure it or whatever. It's just very labor-intensive, but it is a short timed crop. It's, it doesn't take you know, six months to do it. It's just a couple of months and you're done. And of course we use tobacco for chewing tobacco, for pipe tobacco, and of course cigarettes. And we had to roll our own until 1880 and then we finally had a factory that would produce cigarettes by the package, which was a great thing. Now I will mention that when I was very, very young, many decades ago, I was able to roll my own cigarette with one hand. I thought I was hot stuff. I mean, I could do it like the cowboys did. Would I smoke one that I rolled myself? No, it was, it, the tobacco was too loosely packed. But I like showing off. Of course, none of you would ever do that. We've already discussed the American Tobacco Company, the Black Patch Wars, so we're not going into that. But all the way up through 1990, tobacco was Kentucky's number one cash crop. But don't forget, we also grew hay and corn and so soybeans. And I remember the few years that we were on the farm in Geneva, Kentucky, that my father alternated. One year he would grow corn, the next year he'd grow soybeans. And people all over the country, they know about corn and hay. But they sometimes forget that soybeans is a very important crop because it is, you can use it for so many things. For lubricants, you can use it for cooking. It's a very useful product. And livestock. Now, you don't think of livestock when you think of Kentucky. But in 1990, our livestock sales produced as much income as our tobacco sales did. And we're not just talking one particular item. We're talking hogs and sh pigs and sheep and poultry and, and cattle. Uh, in 1990, we were 14th in the nation in the raising of hogs, 13th in sheep, 35th in poultry. But now that's changed since 1990 because we've got all those nice little, shall we say, chicken ranches all around the country. And cattle. You never think of cattle when you think of Kentucky. And we have this, the state, only state east of the Mississippi that has more, the most cattle. Can we challenge Texas? Of course not. I said east of the Mississippi. And mules. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have ever been around mules or not. Uh, 
<laughs> they're a very hardy animal. They're very strong. They're very, very self-willed. You think a cat is self-willed. I mean, a mule. Ugh. And I vividly remember my uncle who had a farm out here on the other side of Kentucky. I was for a... Uh, out in Panther Creek, he had mules that pulled his plow even up in the 40s and 50s. By 1900, we had more than 190,000 of them. Of course, we lost quite a few during the war, too. But as we begin to be mechanized, and you don't need a mule to pull your plow if you've got a tractor. So they went downhill with horses. When anybody thinks of Kentucky, they think of race horses and they think of beautiful old southern plantations and feuds. Uh, we're noted for having racing champions. And between 1882 and 1991, one third of all the champion racing horses were from Kentucky. In 1992, over one fifth of all the foals that were produced were from Kentucky. But in 1989, our horse sales began to fall, and we began to actually make more money on stud fees than we did on actual horse races and horse sales. Horse race sales and stud fees in 1990 brought in less money than the sales of cattle. Although our state's image still remains the same, and the horse racing industry has a very, very strong lobby in Frankfurt, um, the image remains the same. But the economics of it's changed, and it, it's just not as big a thing now as it was once. But we still have the image, and that's good too. But agribusiness. It's kind of like an oxymoron. You think of farming as, you know, plowing and, and planting corn and tobacco and stuff, and you think of business as something in a town, but it's come to the point where you have to be a business if you're going to make any money in farming. But unfortunately, modernization had bypassed rural Kentucky, and as stated in your text, only one in four had, had no electricity or phone or even a hard surface road to get from town to their place. Uh, farming was not attractive at all. Whereas back in 1880, over two-thirds of the labor force in Kentucky was working on farms. In 1940, it was down to one-third. And in 1920, only 93,000 farms statewide. That's not good. We really decreased. But coming into the 21st century, in 1990, Kentucky was fourth in the nation in farms. And that's good. So what were some of the advantages to Kentucky farmers? Well, number one, we had survived the Civil War. As I said, no ravages, no destruction of property as much as they had in the other states and our farm products were valued we did good work when we could get them harvested and planted and only one-fourth of all of our Kentucky farmers were actually tenant farmers which were people that didn't own their own land but lived on the land and farmed for a share of the profits and eight percent of those were African Americans which was so far less than it was in the deep south so we didn't have the race problems in the further south that they did and coming into the 20th century, 85% of our farmers actually owed no money or mortgages on their farms. Yet, by 1994, out of 50 states, we're 22nd in farm income. That's not good. But crop rotation and soil conservation have become to be accepted. Instead of doing it just the same way the dad did it, the same way the granddad did it, everybody did the same way, never changed. Uh, partially because of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, they began to introduce to Kentucky farmers new methods, uh, hybrid plants, how to use chemical herbicides and pesticides. They begin to educate the farmer on how to use fertilizers. And when you make use of all these new methods, your farm production is going to increase. But by having to be educated and learn all this stuff, uh, now farming is not personal. You're not just farming because you want to take care of your family and maybe sell a few extra goods. It's a business. It's very professional. And in 1992, 27% of our crop production was sold overseas. And I know that surprised the date I saw them because when I first came back to Kentucky in the 1980s, I went to work for a, a local farm uh, supplier. And I was so surprised to find that I was dealing with invoices from China and Japan. I, I just blew my mind. I mean, little state of Kentucky, what's she doing selling stuff overseas? And that's when I was learned the hard facts of life, that a lot of our production is going overseas. And our farmers, this is agribusiness. They're using computers. They're worrying about interest rates and shipping rates. And, and they live in nice brick homes that are air conditioned. And they have dishwashers and all the modern conveniences in their brick home. They're up-to-date modern city people living on farms. But 50% of our farmers are actually in what we call agribusiness. And the other half are what we call part-time farmers. Uh, 
which is exactly what it means in part time. They, they cannot survive on what they farm. Uh, they may be feeding their family and selling a few products, but they can't survive. They, both the husband and the wife have to have outside jobs. And by 1990, only nine of Kentucky County's 120 actually can, were considered dependent upon farming for survival. So the rural, self-sufficient yeoman farmer was an ideal, but it was not a reality in Kentucky. Commerce. Now, commerce and timber, you think, well, how's timber a commerce? Well, timber is a commodity. Uh, the timber itself isn't so much commerce, but what you produce from the timber is. And the sad thing is, is poverty of some of our rural Kentuckians lead them to, well, they can't plow the field. There's too many trees and there's too many rocks and hills, so we'll just cut the trees down and sell the wood. Well, if you're doing it for immediate rewards, you don't care anything about replanting. So you strip the forest and you don't think of anything about reforesting. So between 1870 and 1920, our rural poverty-stricken areas were going gangbusters and stripping forests and selling it. Unfortunately, they got money for selling the, the, the wood or the timber, but the things that were made from it were made in other states. The people who owned the big lumber companies were outside the state owners, so any profits from this timber business would go outside the state. But by 1990, Kentucky was furnishing 11% of all the hardwood produced in the United States. But there again, and I can't fish it strong enough, 75% of all the lumber that was processed or cut down here in our state was shipped unprocessed out of the state. So the profits there again, outside the state. And you don't ever think of iron and steel as being industries or commerce for Kentucky, but in 1830 we were number three in the United States. And it, as soon as the war was over, we, we began this big decline, primarily because as your text mentioned, uh, you need a lot of timber to have a hot fire to produce iron. And the timber was getting less and less, and the iron that was being produced was of very poor quality, and therefore it couldn't be sold. The same thing with steel. Oh, big plans, right? Big plans. Foreign investors coming in from overseas, and they build this town called Middlesboro, and oh man, it's going to just go gangbusters, and it's going to rival Birmingham and Pittsburgh. But there was a fire in 1890 that destroyed the city, and then two years later, we had a mammoth United States wide depression. And it just didn't come back, so it never really came to fruition. And if it had any capital from it, would have been from outside sources, and the profits would have gone right straight back outside. So most towns in Kentucky, whether they were small or big, they had either little business or no industry. But we do have some towns that are growing. I mean, everything isn't stagnating. Ashland's growing because of the timber industry. Owensboro had a humongous wagon company, and of course we're a tobacco center for selling. Paducah, although the text doesn't say why, it's growing. It is growing, but it's right there on the river. So you can only use your imagination and imagine why it's growing. It's growing because people are coming there to live and to do business in a small town that has a great transportation. Lexington, in the center of the state, not on a river, although she does have a railroad, uh, she was known as a small, pretty little village. She wasn't growing very much, but she was a supplier of needed goods to the surrounding rural area, which they couldn't have gotten along without. But then there's Louisville. We always come back to Louisville, don't we? It's the only truly manufacturing area of the state, and it was untouched by the Civil War. As a matter of fact, it grew and prospered in the Civil War. And as soon as the Civil War was over, she, began, she was one of the first ones to sell stuff down the Mississippi River to her sister states in the South. We had one of the most reputable and biggest southern newspapers, the Louisville Courier Journal. We had the Louisville and National Railroad, L&N. We had dry goods stores. We had plow factories. We had large banking capitals. We had it was a chief leaf tobacco market where you could bring it to sell. We had the textile industry. We had the leather processing plant. We had paint and varnish plants. We had a pork processing center. And the list goes on and on. The population doubled in less than 30 years between 1870 and 1900. And in 1900, it was the nation's 18th largest city. And you're putting it in a company with you know San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago and you know, all the big cities. We're up there. And she had theaters and parks and Churchill Downs and 175 miles of streetcar tracks. And of course, she had telephones and, and electric lights and daily ice delivery. And she continued her growth into the 20th century. And then a flood in 1937, the big flood, uh, devastated the town along with every other town along the Ohio River. But she was just starting to come back when World War II came along and growth was again stimulated.
but she does have an aging population. And after the war, and then she did slow down in growth, and some of the older companies either chose to leave or close their doors. In the 1960s and 70s, we began to have racial violence because of the Civil Rights Act. Then we had a series of labor strikes. And you've got people moving out of Louisville into the suburbs, taking businesses and things with them. But in 2000, of the 10 largest publicly owned companies in the state, six of them were located in Louisville. So she's not dead now, by any chance. Liquor. Don't you love that? In 1886, for every 55 men, there was one saloon. We had 172 distilleries. You could say there was one in every county, and some counties had more than one. 34% of all the United States liquor was manufactured in Kentucky. Then we had a depression in the 1890s, which I've mentioned a couple of times here, but we don't go into it too much. But there was a mammoth nationwide depression in uh, the 1890s, lasted from 92 to 94. And then lo and behold, coming in the 20th century, that 19th Amendment was passed. Prohibition. And of course, Louisville distillers had to close, and any town in Kentucky that was depending on liquor manufacturers was hurt or disappeared. It's kind of like when you had a railroad coming through your town, and all of a sudden the railroad didn't come through anymore. But in 1937, the 19th Amendment had been repealed, and we were again producing. And six short years later, 68% of the sour mash produced in the United States was produced in Kentucky. Now, in 1990, 90% of all bourbon produced in the United States was produced in Kentucky. 70% of all the spilled spirits in the United States produced in Kentucky. And by the late 20th century, well, like I said, we've got other towns growing. We, we do have the General Electric plant in Louisville. We've got the IBM plant in Lexington. We've got Armaco Steel in Ashland. We've got a Ford plant in the, in the States that's producing 8.5 million cars in 87. And, and Bowling Green acquired a General Motors plant in 80. I think they make those little bitty fast cars. In 89, you've got the Humana Corporation form, which is all the way health care type thing. It is generating huge revenues. And the Kentucky Fried Chicken, Long John Silver, we've got all these franchises in the state. And even though we're not at the tail end of anything, uh, looking at us, we don't look half bad. We've got some good stuff going on. But we are a little bit short on large financial institutions. And then you've got King Coal and the Mineral World. Now, when one thinks of Kentucky, other than horses and feuds, most people think about coal. Now, coal, I can say, formed millions of years ago. Uh, a commodity that was once for local use only and mined in small communities. And unlike timber, a very non-renewable resource. Now, we had sold coal outside of our borders for years. In 1870, just a little bit less than 150,000 tons of coal were sold. But 10 years later, they, they, make, they met the million ton mark. And as late as 1900, coming into the 20th century, more than half of the coal that was dug in our commonwealth was still used by people here in Kentucky. And the early mines, and there were thousands of them, uh, they were owned by local people. And sometimes we'd have these talented immigrants come in from um, Ireland and Germany who knew like coal, uh, how to mine, and they would show us how to do some things. But for the most part, it was, you know, here. But after the Brothers War, after the, uh, shall we say, Civil War, people who had known about our vast safe reserves and, and coal, especially in eastern Kentucky, uh, they didn't want to get too involved because you remember how all that violence that we've been having going on. You've got the feuds, you've got bad roads, you can't get transportation. Uh, there just isn't any way to get into it. But a man called John C. C. Mayo, smart man. He took advantage of the instrument called the Broad Land Deed. And this particular piece of paper gave the man who owned it, he'd come into you and he'd want to purchase the minerals on your land. And you say yes, he'd give you probably a dollar an acre if you were lucky. And therefore had the legal right to come in and strip your land of any minerals he could find. And he didn't have to agree to put the land back the way it was. He could dig big holes and just walk off and leave them. But by coming into the 19, uh, late 19th century, he had acquired thousands and thousands of acres just for about a dollar. Now, he symbolizes, I guess you'd say, the revolution that's beginning to take place in eastern Kentucky that's going to change the face of that region. Railroads are slowly inching into the isolated areas. And sometimes, virtually overnight, and I think your text mentions one town that one day had a little tent or one little cabin, and within a matter of days, it had 
was a booming coal town. And it had, you know, schools and libraries and hospitals and all that good stuff. Uh, sometimes they even paved the streets. And by 1920, the eastern Kentucky is booming with these little coal towns. Why would people go to mine? Well, they had no future. They had no wages. They had no electricity, no education, no entertainment. Uh, what were they going to do? Uh, like the man said when he asked, you, you couldn't make a living on the farm. Uh, you had no choice. The problem was, <laughs> they, you would move to a company town to work. And these company towns, well, let's just say your prosperity and your change in lifestyle is going to come at a higher price. It gave you hope, yes. It allowed you to be able to purchase goods and to be entertained and get schools and, and things like this. Uh, but these company towns, they were run like little kingdoms. The company town controlled where you lived, you lived in a company house. It encouraged you to vote properly. It encouraged, told you which hospital to go to, which library to go to. Uh, you'd have to go to company-owned stores. And in a lot of cases, they paid you with what they called company script, which was a good wage for what you did, but it, the script wasn't good anywhere except in this one town. So the company town is controlling you physically and socially and psychologically. They're controlling every aspect of your life. And Pike and Harlan counties were the two most notorious coal mining towns. Now, when the things were not going good and the price of coal was down, your infrastructure of your town is going to suffer. The houses would remain unpainted. Uh, gold dust would be hanging in the air, turning gray. Sanitation wouldn't be picked up. Uh, garbage wouldn't be collected. And when towns are going good and they run good, uh, everybody does benefit. The children get an education. You get ed uh, medical care. You you. It's good, but you have a series of boom and bust. Boom and bust. When you boom and everything is going good, when it's busting, things are not going good for you. And mechanization, of course, is going to reduce the demand for the need of actual miners. You have the surface mining or strip mining in western Kentucky and the deep mining in eastern Kentucky. And the little film I've got for you to see, as well as a but Texas, I think, does a really good job of describing it's dangerous. But the demand for coal diminishes. Most of the coal used nowadays is used in utility production. Uh, but I remember when my grandmother used to have coal delivered weekly to her house, and the man would come up in a big old coal wagon pulled by horses and uh, shovel it down this little chute into the basement. And it would be dusty and smelly, and it just was not a nice thing. But that's what they heated with. But now most of the utilities uh, that are producing your electricity and things are produced because of coal. And back in 1910, the Kentucky was the ninth producer in the U.S. And about 19 years later, she was the third. But in 1978, she was the number one producer of coal in the country. And in the 1980s, 17% 17, 17 of all coal came from Kentucky, not just certain types. And what protection did the farmer have? Well, labor union was produced in 1890, right after the Civil War. But... That wasn't any good protection. Uh, you can't enforce any law if it's not there. Then, in 1935, I think it was, the Wagner Act was passed, which gave us the right to form unions and to uh, arbitrate. But by the time this happens, the Wagner Act giving you the right to do things, uh, the depression's on, and you're not going to do anything that's going to cost you your job. But, you know, <laughs> the Kentucky officials had a virtual reign of terror on unsafe working conditions. You had dust explosions, you had unsafe working conditions, of course. Um, bad air, not properly ventilated, it just was not a good place to work. But they went in fatalistically. They had nothing else to do. They had gas explosions sometimes. Um, in 1903 there was a report that found most miners and a most mines were in a very deplorable and bad condition, which is putting it mildly. More than 42 people died in Kentucky mines in 1912, as a matter of fact. And when you go into these counties, sometimes you'll see signs, and it says on the sign how many people have died in the coal mine accidents. But as bad as, as the conditions were, with the collapsing roofs and poor ventilation and explosions, uh, the most damaging thing that happened to the miners was the mechanization and the drop in the coal demand.
between 1950 and 1965, the number of underground mines operating fell some 70 percent. And it's continuing to slide today, although you hear all the way around that this coal mine is going to reopen, that coal mine is going to reopen, but something always seems to happen to stop it. Although we do have better working conditions today. And Ashland Oil Company, now you don't think of Kentucky as an oil state, and we really weren't. But Ashton Oil was one of the few ones that actually made some money. They employed 31,000 by 1994. And, and unlike those other foreign investors, they came into an area and they invested in the area. They, they, they donated to schools. They got uh, scholarships. They have public libraries. They gave back to the community. So they were good. But like I say, we're not a big oil state, although there is some oil here. And that word floor spur, uh, is, is it that important? But I'll bet you dollars to donuts. Each one of you looked at that and just went off. What is that? You don't really care. So I put down here the chemical composition. Floor spur can, is 51% calcium, 48% fluorine. And it's made into a chemical that's used in refrigeration and, and an awful lot of military applications. At one time, we were the main producer where we dug it out of the ground, but now it's imported from China. And I just thought it was an unusual type of thing. Rivers, rails, and roads. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, number one, because we've gone through transportation and we know we've got all those beautiful rivers that we can navigate on. And the LN Railroad, we've discussed that several times, based out of Lexington. And once upon a time, riding on trains was quite the thing to go. But by the 1990s, it's not the way to go because of automobiles and airplanes, of course. And most of the railroads are used for transporting coal or freight. And actually, coal is the main user of the railroads. And we're beginning to see public transportation in the cities, too. By 1890, we've got electric trolleys. Well, they didn't last very long. They were romantic, but they didn't last very long. By the 1930s, most of the big cities' electric trolleys were gone because the age of the automobile has arrived. Did everyone have an automobile? No, of course not. Number one, you've got the expense of it. Income in Kentucky wasn't that large. And in the cities, you did. The cities got them earlier than anybody else, of course. But the main objection was we didn't have anything to drive them on. We didn't have good roads. When they finally did come around to trying to fix roads, because there again, Kentucky's always short of money, they were using forced labor for the maintenance of them. And later on, they started coming up with some other ways to come up with money. But at the beginning, they were kind of, you know, how are we going to pay for this? But the public bus became a you know, transportation. Once the electric trolleys were gone, you had public buses. And it wasn't long before you needed buses for schools. Well, if you're going to have buses, and public and school buses, you've got to have something for them to drive on. So they've got to come up with a way to do something. So by 1930, the old roads were being replaced by asphalt. And the old roads were, you know, like wooden and brick or stone. They began to use gasoline tax. Because if you're going to have cars, you've got to sell them gasoline. So we're going to have gasoline tax. And fees from certain uh, licenses you'd have to buy would be used to... Uh, help build play for the roads. And now the last stagecoach, I just thought that was kind of cool, that the last stagecoach in Kentucky was run in 1911. And then right underneath there we got air travel. <laughs> quite, a, quite a distance there. Uh, Louisville actually had their first airplane airport in 1919. It wasn't but just eight years after we had the last stagecoach. Now think about that for a minute. We went from horse-drawn things to flying in the air like a bird. Did everyone fly? No, it was an old biplane, but they did have it. But now we've got the uh, United Personal Service hub is in Louisville. And even Winsboro has a little airport. And every time you turn around, we got these little farm airports because a lot of people have on um, big agribusinesses have their own airports and farms. So Kentucky slowly is coming into the 20th century in progress. She's not real happy about it. And she's coming, kicking, and screaming. But we're getting there, folks. Now, you probably know more about Kentucky's land and her commerce than you ever really wanted to know. So take a deep breath, have a cup of coffee, take a nap or walk around the room a bit. And if you haven't already viewed the YouTubes on the coal, the horse, and the tobacco, then read chapter 20. And after that, there is the quiz and the graded questions and a test over chapter 17, 18, 19, and 20. That being said, 